And now introducing our wonderful speaker. Um, it's really a challenge <laughs> to introduce Beatrice uh, Luna in less than a minute. Uh, she's the Staunton Professor of Pediatrics and Psychiatry at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, rather than list her many, many, many <laughs> numerous and enormous uh, achievements, I will try to convey sincerely what a pleasure it is to have you here, Beatrice. Um, I first heard her actually many years ago <laughs> at a symposium uh, called, uh, I think, Hamlet and the Adolescent Mind. <laughs> You remember, so uh, we were presenting together and I heard her and she truly opened up, at least to me and I think to many people in the audience, a science that illuminates emotions and illuminates thinking. Um, it's a science that is based obviously on neuroimaging and it, it provides a phenomenology that I think uh, is very unique on how adolescents think, feel, appraise the world, make decisions. And it's therefore, as her, as her title is suggesting, very helpful um, clinically already. Um, and for parents and clinicians, it really helps us understand how adolescents come to make decisions that we often dread. <laughs> so um, without further ado, Please welcome Beatrice, who is really, last but not least, uh, a, if not the premier neurocognitive developmental scientist in the world. So welcome, Beatrice. Thank you, everyone. Are we there? Hi, everyone. Can you hear me with the microphone? Yes. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, people here live and for people join in Zoom. I am delighted. I've been trying to come here for a long time. We had something called a pandemic that delayed it and delayed it and delayed it. So I'm very, very happy that I can finally speak to all of you about the work that we've been doing for now more than 20 years with the explicit aim of understanding what are the neural mechanisms that underlie the transition from an adolescence to adulthood when lifetime trajectories are going to be established. Now, why are we interested in adolescence? There are two things that make it extremely unique. One of them is that across cultures, across species, during adolescence, there is a peak in sensation seeking that can lead to risk-taking behavior. And you know the risk-taking behaviors, anywhere from experimenting with drugs to car accidents, delinquency, et cetera. But in many ways, we see this as an adaptive and critical period of development. And you'll see as I as I present to you more and more the evidence that we've been finding for this. Another thing that makes adolescence particularly interesting is that for some reason, major psychopathologies start to emerge at this time. Why? In fact, the National Institutes of Mental Health have been giving me continuous funding to please figure this out because they recognize that you know, an important key to understanding psychopathology is adolescence. There is a shift that either is breaking the system and or bringing to the fore a predisposition that had always been there. So it's very important to understand what is this transition. Now, something that is also particularly interesting is the fact that across psychopathologies, the cognitive and reward system is always affected. It may not define a psychopathology in itself, but it is always affected. And I'm sure many of you are aware of the enormous literature linking, you know, 
limitations and in inhibitory control and reward assessment, et cetera, in different sorts of psychopathologies. And interestingly, these are the two systems that are undergoing significant specialization in the adolescent period. So this is where we have really been focusing on. Now, overall, the way that we've been looking at adolescents, and, and you'll see this in the statistical modeling that we do of our, of our um, work, is that initially, brain, neurocognitive maturation, right? So brain and cognition is proceeding in a fashion of accumulation. You're learning to walk, learning to talk, the brain is getting bigger. But by the time that you reach adolescence, everything is already there. So that's a very important proposal that we have been saying. There's nothing missing. In fact, there's more than what you need if you think of synaptic pruning, et cetera. It, therefore, there is a change in brain maturation to now have specialization. So you have all of this, you have experience that will help you prune and sculpt so that you can determine what the adult trajectory will be. And this will also position you into aging. So it is something that, that will persist for a long time. So in the field, this aspect of adolescence, we all agree that there is a particular relationship between executive cognitive systems and motivational affective systems predominating over these executive systems. Now note that I do not say in balance. You might hear that sometimes about adolescents. There's nothing wrong. It is not an illness. It is not a limitation. It is a very necessary period that we need to understand. And one thing that is very evident that everybody agrees is this predominance of the control of effective systems. Now, several dual systems models have emerged. For example, BJ Casey had one very early on where she was proposing the basal ganglia might be maturing earlier than executive systems. We know that that is not true at all. We know that basal ganglia striatum sometimes even have an even more protracted maturational trajectory than prefrontal systems. Uh, and then Larry Snyder, he was like, okay, we all now recognize that there is heightened functionality of motivational systems, of emotion and reward processing, but in the context of a cognitive system that is immature. And as you can see, this linear relationship that is often used as if cognition continues to improve forever. <laughs> However, what we have found, and you can see my mouse? Yeah, good. What, are we, what I will be presenting to you today is evidence for the model that we've been proposing, which is called the driven dual systems model. And it is different and unique in the fact that it proposes that adolescence is defined by all of a sudden having availability to adult level cognitive systems. And that is critical to defining adolescence. But these systems are being driven by this heightened motivational drive. And this became extremely relevant to me and very much informed by the fact that I participated in some US Supreme Court briefs. The first one was the life um, uh, was the death penalty in juveniles, where they quoted a lot of my work a very long time ago. Um, and then when Life Without Parole came, the American Medical Association asked me to help them writing the brain parts of that brief. So there you really look at, you know, the, the, the sort of um, crimes that were committed, like not that we looked at Columbine, but it's an example. Planning is there. Abstract thought is there. But it is being driven by emotion, by pure acceptance, by all these things that have a brain component that I will show to you in our evidence. There we go. So our approach is to use a multimodal um, approach. <laughs> we have a very comprehensive behavioral battery, 
where we look at cognition, we look at reward processing, but even, you know, we assess puberty, um, externalizing, internalizing symptoms, a very comprehensive understanding. And we do this in a population that we refer to as normative. What that means is that the individual or the first degree um, relative do not have an access one psychiatric disorder because we really want to set up what the normative range will be so we have the sensitivity to understand when it's going to run. And then we use multimodal neuroimaging approaches so that we can understand the brain structure in particular white matter connectivity. We also look at resting state and task fMRI we look at neurochemistry, and I'll be talking to you about dopamine and GABA and glutamate and the role that they play in adolescence and so forth. And also, you know, direct current, MEG and EEG, which has been around for a very long time, but it really does provide a more direct assessment of neural signaling than even neuroimaging. So based on the work that we've done and what I'll be presenting to you today, this driven dual systems approach has really shown great support. It's become more refined. I've given these talks to practitioners and they have said it is significantly changed the way that they deliver uh, medicine with adolescents. Just very briefly, for example, now realizing that they can engage the adolescent in self-care and not always be dependent on parents, which results in a more effective intervention. All right, so first let me tell you what we have found out that leads us to believe that yes, these um, executive systems are in line by adolescents. So first a little bit about behavior. So what we have been using are oculomotor cognitive tasks. These are based in neuroscience models. These are tasks that have been used in monkey studies. We know the neurochemistry, the neuronarmy, the electrophysiology, et cetera, because we want to make that link between brain and behavior. Um, the anti saccade task is just very simply, we show a light and we say, don't look at it. Very simple, very difficult, especially for children and for adolescents who will look at the light and that correct themselves. So it's a very elegant and strong way to probe the integrity of cognitive control, specifically inhibitory control. We also have used the memory guided saccade test where we ask participants to look at a light, remember where it occurred, come back to fixation, and then you wait, there's that delay period where working memory will be engaged. And then in the absence, in the complete absence of any exogenous pro, uh, probe, they are to command their eyes based on the information in working memory. So again, another very elegant way to really probe um, cognition. Also, unlike a lot of neuropsychological tasks, you know, where kids with their expertise that you see in video games, they can apparently look better than they actually are. You cannot cheat in eye movement tasks. You cannot learn. There are no strategies because saccades are the fastest movement that the human body can make. So it's, it's a very strong probe of cognition. Anyway, so what I'm showing you here, and for most of the graphs that I'll show you, age will be on the horizontal axis, and then whatever we are testing will be on the y-axis. Here, I'm showing you the number of errors that they did, how many times they looked at the light, and here, the accuracy of their working memory guided uh, response. And what we see in other laboratories see over and over again is that there is a significant improvement that does not reach adult levels until 18 to 20 years of age. Of course, I just told you, adolescents have the availability of adult level cognition, but they're still not performing at adult level. But you know, there are many ways to study cognition. In fact, many people use all, and so do we. We use computerized uh, assessments of cognition. It, you might recognize some of these. There's paper and pencil ones. 
all trying to tap into these same sorts of, uh, of processes. So uh, Brendan Turbo Clemens, who was a grad student in my lab, we still collaborate. Uh, he's now a postdoc at MTH Harvard. He's about to get a K. He's extremely well sought after. So if anyone's interested, this is the time to try to get him. There are a couple of students that I'll tell you about because they're amazing. He just had a paper in Nature. You might be aware of it. Um, um, him with another student that used to be my, um, my grad student. I'm in the paper, but obviously they're the ones who know this. You know, really showing that for making brain-wide associations with neuroimaging, you need thousands of individuals. Anyway, so what he did here is he brought together big data. He went and he got data from different big projects like Encanda, the Nathan Klein, the, the PNC, and, and two of our large data sets, including one which has a 15 year longitudinal follow-up with neuroimaging. We have that available publicly in NDAR. If anybody wants it, go and get it. A lot of people are using it already. So that he would have more than 10,000 individuals who were assessed developmentally using all different approaches for cognitive assessment. And applying nonlinear um, curve modeling, what he found was that there is a canonical, oh, sorry, I, I'm gonna that time, um, general cognitive component shared by no matter how you're probing cognition. And you can see the shape of development is very much what, what our model has been proposing. Accelerated growth, and then adolescence is this elbow that determines stability. And I can't tell you how important that elbow is. And that is what we're trying to understand. Something is making that elbow occur and having stability. And, you know, that the underlying all these cognitive processes is domain general uh, processes. So now let's go to the brain. I'll go back to those uh, eye movement tests. This is old work. I'm just showing you this evidence, this line of evidence. And you're like, well, mm, adolescents are not performing like adults. Could it be prefrontal cortex? Could it be dorsolateral prefrontal cortex? And what I'm showing you here with age is, you know, how much you're engaging DLPFC for inhibitory control and working memory. And what we see is that there is a significant decrease in its engagement from childhood to adolescence, but by adolescence it's being used just like at adult levels because you need prefrontal cortex when you're doing something difficult and it's difficult for you to engage voluntary executive systems. But by adolescence, you already can, which is the whole argument. In fact, what underlies these, you know, the fact that they're not performing at adult levels are things like engaging the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. I call that the alarm system of the brain. It's when you commit an error and the brain rings an alarm. Oh, engage cognitive systems, engage cognitive systems. And that is not fully mature by adolescence. And it might be adaptive. This is a time where you need exploration, having an alarm may not be the most adaptive way of doing this. And with respect to working memory, it's the ability to go and engage uh, parts of the brain that are explicitly needed for precision of your response. So in this case, a visual spatial working memory task, we need to engage visual association cortex, and that increases the development. Now, as I've shown you, cognition, when you look at mean performance, is getting better all the way into the 20s. But one thing that people who study development don't always talk about because they find it annoying, I don't blame them, is the fact that there's so much intra-subject and also inter, but here I'm referring to intra-subject variability among trials. Sometimes they perform at adult levels, most of the time they do not. And what we have been doing in my lab is we have a theme, noise is not garbage. There's a piece of the puzzle for understanding noise. So one thing that we did, and I love this paper, is um, David Montes who came from a monkey uh, um, laboratory where they looked at variability at the neural level 
and behavioral level and saw how this was actually associated, he came and he said, let's do that with our brain data. And he looked at brain in a very unique and powerful manner where he looked at whole brain patterns of activity, not just like the things that light up. And he did that. He looked at the mean activity during encoding, maintaining, and retrieval of working memory information. And he saw that that does not change with development. If you are doing encoding, maintaining, and retrieving, your brain has to look a particular way. What I'm showing you in this GIF is that those patterns of activity fluctuate in the, mag the magnitude that they are expressed. So sometimes they are, they are expressed at a very high level, sometimes a lot less. And what I'm showing you here, very much as what has been found in monkey studies, is that behavioral variability is associated with this brain expression variability. And these decrease with age. And I find this to be such an important finding that we have. Oh, this is not right. <laughs> um, because it's implying that perhaps the brain, just like behavior wise, it is actually in a process of exploration. It is saying, mm, let me try it this way. Okay, that kind of work. Let me try it this way. Mm, all right. And the adolescent period is this trial period. So that once you find the most optimal way to engage patterns of executive function, that's when the brain, I'll tell you a little bit more about critical plasticity, will decide, all right, the cement this with myelination, et cetera, and this will be the way that you continue. More recently, and this is under review, um, we have gone and looked at EEG studies. Why? Because we really want to understand the, the particular aspects of these processes. So for example, in working memory, recent evidence has really shown that although it was believed that neural activity was maintained during delay period, when you look at, at the trial level, this was work by Earl Miller at MIT, you find that no. It's gamma bursts are bursting throughout the delay period, reactivating these memories until you're ready to respond. So Shane McCune, a BioE PhD student, BioE students are awesome, by the way. Um, she's, she took this upon herself. We did an EEG study, typical EEG. The one thing I wanna point out is that now she looked at spectral event processing so she could look at the level of the trials, very similar to what is done in monkey neurophysiology. And what she found was, first of all, as we have always found before, behavior is improving all the way into the 20s, accuracy, the reaction time to produce a correct response, the variability, everything decreasing. And by the way, Decreasing is gonna be a very big theme of what we have found, which is what I define as specialization. And what she found, again, were decreases in the gamma band, decreases in the trial power, decreases in the number of these gamma bursts. I know people keep thinking development, there should be increases, things are getting better, but the neural processes that underlie it are becoming refined and fewer because they're becoming more optimized. So what you end up with are fewer opportunities to have gamma bursts because that's all you need in order to do work in memory at optimal levels in adulthood. All right, so this is just a, a few examples of a really large uh, body of work from us, but other uh, laboratories as well really showing that cognition is available by adolescents. We remember many trials that are performing at adult levels. It is just not consistent. So there's something about being able to engage the circuitry that allows you to maintain control that is actually changing. So we really need to understand that other part of the equation. And that is the limbic motivational emotional processing uh, part of the equation. So I told you about the anti saccade the inhibitory control, and how everybody, many laboratories, it's such a reliable finding, 
Teens do not perform at adult levels. We all know that. Okay. So what we've been doing for years now, many different studies that have been published, is that sometimes in some trials we say, you know what, if you do this right, if you inhibit that response, we're going to give you more money. And a miracle occurs. A miracle. All of a sudden, adolescents can do this task. Almost at adult levels. How is that possible? We've all known that they can't do this. What is going on? money, reward, and what we found, and this is more as a background because all, all this has been published for a while now, what we found was that when they're presented with the opportunity to win a reward, their ventral striatum goes nuts. It's like, oh my God, I'm going to get a reward, much more than adults. And I'm showing you here in red, these are adolescents and these are adults doing these rewarded trials. They are really driving this. So all of a sudden they're like, okay, okay, reward might be coming. And at the same time, they're really driving these other regions that are critical for executive control. So what reward is doing is, yes, this is difficult for them to do. It's allowing them to press that accelerator so that they can really drive the system and get that reward. And this is good to understand when thinking about adolescence, that there is this inherent neurobiological system that is made for reward. And you know, rewards is not just like, yay, I got a reward. It is the essential basic mechanism of learning. So we're like, okay, we really need to start understanding the dopaminergic system. So Deepu Murthy, who is um, now faculty at Temple University when he was in the lab, he had already figured out how to really zone in into the VTA, the ventral tegmental area. This is the part of the brain that produces dopamine. And he said, I wonder if this is its connectivity, its functional connectivity with the ventral striatum, critical region for reward processing, is that changing with development? And what I'm showing you here is that during resting state, we see that no, these two regions, when they're coupled at rest, do not change with age. However, in the context of a rewarded state, you see that they're very highly coupled during adolescence. And what we see with maturation, with development, is an attenuation of that coupling. And you'll see that a lot in all the studies that we found. The theme is the attenuation of motivational processes on an already available cognitive system. So we're like, okay, we need to understand what the heck is going on with dopamine. And, um, in the field of developmental cognitive neuroscience, also in the clinical field, we often think, oh, dopamine, like this thing is, you know, behaving in this manner or impaired. But dopamine is extremely complex, like every neurotransmitter system. There is presynaptic dopamine availability, there is postsynaptic changes in different parts of the brain, different receptors, changes in the receptor density. So we're like, and, and they all, and what we did here with Bart Larson, who's brilliant um, grad student, he is um, doing his postdoc at UPenn with Ted Satterwhite, got a K99 in two seconds. And he's also looking for a job offer. So if anybody wants a brilliant person, Bart Larson and Brandon are, are, the, are the people. I'm even trying to get them back. <laughs> um, in any case, so he went into the animal literature and found that in fact, yeah, these systems are developing at different rates. We can't just look at one thing. But you really can't, you know, the IRB doesn't let you like cut teens' brains open or <laughs> things and look at dopamine. So we have to be very creative. And in this study, we did the following. We used a molecular MRI machine. What is that? That is a 3T semen scanner that also is equipped with PET and you can acquire both of them simultaneously. Still, PET is not something the parents are wild about having their kids do because it involves an IV, it involves you know, injecting some radioactivity. It's really not that much, it's the equivalent of an international flight, but I understand right, that that would be difficult. So what we did is that we did, um, we found another way to start understanding dopamine. And, and this might be very valuable for some people here. So I'll go ahead and do it. We looked at tissue iron. 
not blood iron, iron in the brain tissue. It is called ferritin. And it, it is predominantly found in the basal ganglia. People who study Parkinson's, restless leg syndrome, ADHD, and aging have been really looking at tissue iron in the basal ganglia to understand the neurophysiology of you know, these different um, conditions. What is really important about tissue iron is that it plays a very important role in the production of dopamine. And thus, why it's so much in the basal ganglia. But no one has really wanted to make that connection directly, but I'm like, come on, is it dopamine or not, right? So let's look at this tissue iron. And, um, and this was very much driven by, by Larson. He's the one who brought the whole idea of the tissue iron, which is now exploded, by the way. And people can contact me if you need to know more. So what we did is that we obtained tissue iron in all participants, 12 to 30 years of age. And we obtained PET in those 18 to 30 years of age. We obtained a direct measure of dopamine availability with DTBZ, which tags the vesicular monoamine transporter, VMAT. And we looked at raclopride, which gives us a postsynaptic measure of D2, D3 receptor density in the striatum. And this is what we found. So first of all, not surprisingly, we found that with age, this measure of tissue arm, which is called R2 prime, was increasing with age. This is known, tissue iron accumulates throughout the lifespan, but it is particularly significant in the adolescent period. If you look at this limbic aspect of it, it's showing that shape that I keep showing you over and over, which actually statistically, it's an inverse function. So we have acceleration and then st stability, which is exactly what we're interested in understanding adolescence. So we're seeing that. And then we're saying, okay, is this really related to direct measures of dopamine? And it is. So this tissue iron is particularly associated with dopamine availability, not with post um, D2, D3 receptor uh, density, but with presynaptic dopamine makes sense because it is involved in the production of dopamine. So I can't tell you how important this has been because it's really saying, here is a non-invasive way to probe the integrity of a very important aspect of dopamine, which is dopamine availability. You don't have to use PET. Not only that, I'll show you later how if any of you do neuroimaging and do EPI, that means task arresting state, you already have tissue iron measures. Where did I go? Oh. All right, so now I'm going to zone in on that 18 to 30 year range where we did PET to see what are the direct measures of PET showing. And what we found was the dopamine availability is not really changing from 18 to 20. Like I showed you before, you know, the stability. So that elbow is occurring before 18 years of age. And when we look at raclopride, and this is a really amazing finding, it came out in Nature Communications, is that we see decreases, again, specialization, decreases in the density of D2, D3 receptors, a finding that is very much akin to synaptic pruning, but now at the receptor level. And when we put this together, the implication that we propose is that perhaps it is occurring is that during that initial period of development, the brain is trying to understand based on your biological predisposition and your environment, how much dopamine you're going to have. This becomes established by adolescence. And then the brain is like, okay, now we know how much, let's refine how many receptors you're going to need. You don't need redundancy. You don't want extra receptors that slows everything and it is suboptimal. So that, that was a really incredible finding. So we became very um, excited of the fact that, oh my God, we, we have this like um, way to really probe dopamine and dopamine has been such an important story of adolescence. People have just been assuming we know, but we don't. So um, 
we've been pushing the um, with new studies. This is Ashley Parr. She just became faculty in my laboratory. She was a postdoc. Um, and what she did in this first study, which was in progress of neurobiology, I believe last year, um, was to look at the functional connectivity of decision making and reward processing. And this is known from the literature. It's pretty much the ventral striatum, right? The nucleus accumbens and its connectivity to, you know, prefrontal cortex, in particular, ventral medial prefrontal cortex that, that does the valuation and the decision making, et cetera. Um, and she looked at this tissue RN measure and also a resting state connectivity. Uh, but in particular, and I can, I can tell you more if anyone's interested, we looked at background connectivity, which we have done in the past. So um, individuals are doing a rewarded task. We take away all the signal that has to do with the task. And what remains is the rewarded state, what is being sustained during a rewarded state. And what she found, and sorry that I'm so dramatic, again, decreases. So here we have decreases in frontal striatal connectivity. Specialization continues to occur. People might think, oh, it might be strengthening. No, we see decreases. And although we know that, you know, the neuroanatomy of the brain indicates that the really, the real direct connections are striatum to frontal, there are indirect connections that loop it back. And what we propose might be occurring is that in fact, there is attenuation of these limbic controls over to prefrontal, allowing prefrontal to have more control over limbic areas. Um, and she found an incredible association with this measure of tissue iron. So the more tissue iron, right, the more dopamine availability is associated with weaker frontal striatal connectivity. So the more dopamine that you have in the striatum, there's more stability that is allowing prefrontal to predominate. And in fact, with the mediation analysis, the tissue iron mediated these decreases in functional connectivity. But what about behavior? What about this inhibitory control? So in her latest paper that came out this year, I believe, she went and she looked at what I told you before, what I'm showing you here is age. In blue, we have adults. I mean, I'm sorry, neutral trials where no rewards are being offered. Red is where rewards are being offered to inhibit your responses. And again and again, we find that there's what we're calling the rewarded boost. During adolescence, you can do a lot better because you have this reward boost. Is this due to tissue iron? Is it due to dopamine availability? And this time, instead of using that R2 prime direct measure of, of tissue iron, which we now know, and we're, we're gonna be publishing this soon, is completely correlated with the T2 star measure from EPI measures. Again, if anybody's interested, let me know, which provides, again, a very nice, reliable signal of, of tissue iron. So she went and what she found there we go. Is it in fact, it is those who have reached a higher tissue iron, which are the ones who are able to leverage the reward circuitry to empower the response. Those teenagers who do not have high tissue iron for their age are still not quite able to, you know, really tap into this resource of elevating all of their circuitry to engage something difficult to do like inhibitory control. So how do we look at these two like executive function and reward processing together? So, so this is um, an older study uh, from Bart Larson, again, brilliant, uh, where we looked at white matter connectivity. So what he did is he looked and identified convergence zones in the basal ganglia. So recently it has been discovered that within the basal ganglia, there are these zones where there are fibers from different sorts of networks that interchange information that will help determine what action 
would be directed by the basal ganglia. So what Bart did is it, he identified the convergence zones for cognitive depicted in blue and for affected limbic regions depicted in red. And he found these convergence zones and he asked the question if the relative integrity of cognitive and affective fibers in these convergence zones were changing with age. And not surprisingly, just like everybody would suspect, when you're younger, particularly in the adolescent period, you find that the integrity of these limbic white matter structural fibers are predominating over the cognitive ones. And with age through adolescence, there is a flip so that you end up with cognitive fibers predominating over them. How does this occur? Well, when you look at the, the development individually of cognitive and affective white matter fibers, you see that their integrity is not changing through adolescence as we have proposed. These systems are already available. It, this switch is actually driven by this attenuation of the limbic fibers. It's almost as saying, you know, okay, you, you did your exploration, time to turn the volume down, and now we have a system that can operate in more in this particular balance. So just to drive home, you know, this relationship that we find, I told you before what Brendan found with the big data set, what is the trajectory of cognitive control? Well, then, you know, he's hilarious. He's like, you're gonna love this. He went and he looked at the National Survey uh, on Drug Use and Health, where there are more than 1 million um, participants that participated to look at risk-taking behavior. And he's like, you're gonna love this, check it out. Very much like the driven dual systems model, which I'm showing you here on the left, but here we show that there's this peak in risk-taking and sensation-seeking at a time when the availability of cognition has come to the fore. So, you know, I'll plant the seeds to think about adolescence in that moment. So one of the last things I wanna to talk to you about is how is this occurring? Why is adolescence so particular? And with uh, Bart, we used to have these amazing conversations that probably lasted too long. Um, we're like, you know, yeah, people say adolescence, it's a sensitive period. And I'm like, is it sensitive or is it critical period plasticity? Let's be bold, let's really see what's happening. And we, by we, I mean Bart, wrote this amazing review paper where he probed, I really recommend it, it's just one of the best papers that we've had. Um, he went into the post-mortem human and animal work and looking at markers of critical periplasticity that might be occurring in association cortex in humans during adolescence. So let me just remind you a little bit about critical periplasticity. We know a lot of this through the visual system. You're born, you open your eyes, you get all this visual stimulation, all this excitation that's coming into visual cortex, really breaking the excitatory inhibitory balance, which is what the brain wants. When that balance is broken, critical periplasticity you know, begins. And we know from Takao Hente's work that what we see in visual cortex is this dramatic increase in GABAergic inhibitory function that will now help with the super excitatory glutamatergic uh, function. And there are changes in the cytoarchitecture to now be able to really process this high signal intensity visual information and balances weeks. So we wanted to see, is this the case in humans? And from these postmortem molecular mechanism, we find that there is some indication that this might be the case. I'm showing you GABA here. GABA, just like every neurotransmitter is complex. It has a lot of different aspects to it, but there's some, some aspects, for, for example, with probabumin varicosities, which are increasing during the adolescent period. Other ones are staying stable. And with, um, with glutamate, there is this molecular evidence that it is decreasing during the adolescent period. And all this in prefrontal um, 
um, cortex. So we're like, okay, we need to look at this. How can we look at this? And I'm sure some of you have heard of spectroscopy. People have been using it for many years, not quite reliable because they're these macromolecules that really dampen the ability to assess something like, for example, GABA, which I'm showing you here. You can hardly see when you look at the spectrum. There's a little bump there that's GABA, right? So you really are, cannot be reliable with using a 1.5 Tesla or a 3 Tesla. You need to go to at least 7 Tesla. You need to more than double the signal to noise to really find what GABA is doing and what glutamate is doing to separate those macromolecules. And of course, we wanted to look at excitatory glutamate, inhibitory GABA, and, and we used uh, magnetic resonance spectroscopic imaging, an approach that allows us to move away from like this one big voxel, which is typically what is used, to a whole slice with multiple voxels all through frontal cortex to try to examine what are these changes. And we looked at 10 to 30 year old normative um, um, population. We, we were extremely conservative in our thresholding of what was good data. We also made sure that we weren't biasing by age, that we were actually retaining the best signal for everybody. And we did all the things that you would do with a developmental study, you know, multiple corrections, head motion, et cetera. And our hypothesis was glutamate is going to decrease and GABA is going to increase. Therefore, it'll become more balanced. But what we found was the following. Yes, we found here in blue is glutamate we have for right and left um, hemispheres, medial areas. We just, you know, collapsed. Um, and yes, we find this dramatic decrease in glutamate through the adolescent period. But GABA was either not changing or actually even decreasing. So that went against what we thought would be occurring. But the real question is, is the balance changing? Because that's what critical periplasticity is about. So we applied a a relatively new approach by Steele et al. in 2020, where you look at the correlation between GABA and glutamate. The more correlated they are, the more balanced that system is. Ratio is what one typically would think, oh, I need to look at the ratio. It's difficult to look at the ratio because as I told you before, when you're young, there is a lot of variability. And so the ratio cannot absorb that variability and it's difficult to look at it um, uh, developmentally, except longitudinally, which our latest findings concur with everything they were finding. So here we look at the correlation. Therefore, no standard error of um, bars, which always drives me crazy when I see people who show with, but here it's correlation, so you can't. And what we see is that in many areas of prefrontal cortex, you see this increase in the balance of excitatory and inhibitory function. Boom, critical period plasticity. Um, and this is what we when proposing. This, um, this paper is in bioarchive. It's being led by Maria Perica, grad student in my laboratory. Uh, we got, after the first submission, minor revisions. We've already responded to that, so it should be out soon. Um, and what we, think is occurring, I mean, we're not calling it straight out critical plasticity. there's more that needs to be done. We have longitudinal data that will concur these findings, but it is very telling that there's this opportunity of, you know, plasticity that will then reach a balance that it's very much driven by glutamate and not by GABA, which might've occurred earlier. Glutamate also speaks to synaptic pruning. So all the pieces are coming together. So in uh, summary, what I wanna leave you with is that we believe that adolescence is a time of critical periplasticity when um, heightened dopaminergic reward and excitatory processes like in glutamate predominate over newly available prefrontal processes that are specializing into adulthood when puberty, and we can talk about puberty as well, mid-direct timing and specialization. 
and these dynamics of specialization may underlie sensation seeking and the vulnerabilities to the emergence of psychopathology. But also plasticity means opportunity for change, for intervention. That's why one of the long-term goals that we have is to have a pediatric growth chart of this neurocognitive development so that we can catch early before we know what a diagnosis is. Someone's kind of falling, try to help them. If nothing else, build up compensatory mechanisms so they don't have a, a, a sentence of a psychopathology for the rest of their life. So overall, the way that we think of adolescents, you're born with a neurobiological predisposition, your ID card, you have an environment and through development, the brain is trying to bring these two together and be adaptive. The brain is not trying to be good or bad. It's what you're giving it and what it has. And what we believe is occurring in adolescents is when the brain goes, okay, all right, you've had a long time. Now we've got to start making decisions. And, you know, it could be like, you have a predisposition for depression, amygdala is running the show. Okay, we will myelinate that. And that will be your trajectory, not trying to be good or bad. That's what you fed it. Now, if you're really lucky, and I wish Matt was here, you can turn out to be someone who is very well adjusted, has been extremely successful, very creative, et cetera. But we are really interested in looking at this variability that speaks to mental illness. And that's why we're trying to look at these neurobiological um, predispositions. So I wanna thank my laboratory. It is a fantastic laboratory, my alumni, they still keep in touch. I wanna really uh, point out Finn Calabro. He's my partner in crime, the Santon Farm Foundation who supports my endowment. And of course the NIMH who has been supporting me continuously. They just gave me a merit award. They have been, I couldn't live without them. Um, and if you like this type of work, I would uh, encourage you to look at Flux, the Society for Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience. I was, um, I started the whole process. I was one of the main founders. I just stepped down as president. We had our last meeting at La Sorbonne in Paris, more than 600 attendees, just mind blowing. The next one, is right down the street from you guys practically. In Santa Rosa, we have these exceptional people that are leading the program and everything that you'll need to do. So thank you very much and I'll take questions. I hope I left some time. Uh, I would say that first of all, thank you for reaffirming the importance of child and adolescent mental health as you always do. Uh, and I do have personally many questions, but I want to make sure that I ask people who are here in the audience uh, if they have any questions. And if not, we have some questions online. Uh, so I'm going to start with the ones that are maybe a bit simpler. So one, one question that we have is uh, whether the amount of tissue iron can be influenced maybe by nutrition. Like, do you have any information about that? This is a question from Virina Metz. You couldn't hear, okay. No, no, so, if it can be influenced, like is it something that can be uh, modulated by nutrition? Do we want to keep stacks away from our adolescents, you know? So. <laughs> There are a couple of aspects to that. One of them is people ask, oh, you know, if you're using test data, is tissue iron affected during reward processing at the moment? The answer is no. Um, it is, you know, your neurophysiology that's established. And yes, we do believe that iron deficiency might also play a role. In fact, we are starting talks with, um, uh, some colleagues who follow uh, a iron deprivation population that we're interested in seeing if that is truly the case. So yes, we don't know how, but it makes sense that it might. Absolutely. Um, another question, this is from um, 
Sharon Packer Rosenthal. So I'm going to simplify her question a little bit, but essentially she's wondering whether you know or see any causation with brain development and ACEs, you know, basically the traumatic events and whether, um, like, do you have any information about ACEs, traumatic events impacting behavior? Oh yeah, sorry, I need to remove my mask. So ACEs would be like traumatic events or things that happen to kids um, or adolescents uh, during development. And also, do you have any data related to socioeconomic uh, variables as well? Um, so absolutely, traumatic events would provide another, you know, when I talk about the neurobiological predisposition interacting with the environment, that includes traumatic events. And, you know, and there are reactive aspects to dealing with the, the trauma that the brain, again, doesn't know if it's good or bad. It's just bringing in the information and it will adapt to the compensatory mechanisms that emerge during that actual trauma. We don't have that information. A lot of my colleagues do. Um, and a lot of my colleagues have looked at adversities such as uh, with SES. We have looked at it a little bit um, and you know, with these really core cognitive processes, we haven't found anything big. Um, so one other question is about um, somebody, Tony, Tony Yang uh, is asking, um, basically he's saying that he's collecting DTI and resting state fMRI data. And could you please let us know, so I think he's gonna contact you, papers to measure iron. Would it be okay if I emailed you? So, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, we just have a chapter, oh, we have a chapter out there, but now we're doing a very elegant, like how to, but we can also just tell you. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. So we have two minutes and does anybody have their hand up? No, okay, so I'm gonna ask you a question. So, Super interesting talk. And I may have overheard your thinking. I don't know if I was right, but like in a sense, adolescence emerges from some maturation process is sort of the zero hypothesis, right? Do you have ideas about how during the development of uh, humanity where lifespans have changed, obviously enormously, like what do you, what do you think about how adolescence has evolved over time. Yeah. And the press is for some reason extremely interesting. But the fact that in Western societies, um, this adolescent period is prolonged, right? So it's going into the 20s. Um, I don't know, medical school, PhD. <laughs> you know, it's 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 this prolonged time that you know, many argue, oh yeah, that they, they are responsible for so long. And the way that I look at it, it's a luxury. The longer time you have to specialize, the better. You find what you really want to do. You find the partner you really want to have, you know, as you're accumulating more and more. So I, I, I see it as a plus. I remember I gave a talk at UNICEF once and it just blew my mind because somebody came up to me and said, oh, you know, in the country that I work, um, we have nine-year-old mothers. And I'm like, oh my God, adolescence is a luxury. It's a luxury of wealth that you have this ability to explore and, and refine in the best way possible. I don't know if that speaks to what you were asking. I think we are out of time. So thank you so much again, Beatrice. And I look forward to speaking with you more, obviously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.